Welcome to Solving Urban Challenges Together, Best Practices for Livable Cities. Thank you for joining us online. Good to have you with us. But why are we here? Well, cities worldwide are attracting more and more people, and so public space is getting increasingly under pressure. Um, we need to do something about that. And we also want to uh, achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so we need to come up with uh, workable and repeatable solutions fast. And Netherlands is committed to contribute to the SDGs by 2030, and that's why we support projects like Closer Cities, our partner in this event. And it's Valentine's Day, of course, a great day to show your love for the city. Um, exchanging ideas, that's how we can speed up the process. That's the idea. And we've already started doing this, so it's a good moment to see what are the lessons learned by the Closer Cities project, what are the boosts, what are the barriers, how can an idea be shareable. We are going to find out, so stay tuned. And while you are watching, a remark may pop up to you or a question, share this with us using the live chat. There is a whole team ready to answer your questions. And in addition, we also have some prizes to be awarded to projects with great urban impact. So no time to waste. Let's kick, kick off with our first guests. At the table, we have Robert Nesselaar. You are the initiator of the Closer Cities project and also a city marketeer. And Ellen Minkman, you are researcher and lecturer, check, sorry, researcher and lecturer at Delft University of Technology. Welcome to you both. Thank, Thank you. you. So um, sharing knowledge. Why are you so, so fascinated about it, Robert? Well, we often hear the word of solidarity nowadays, and it's really in fashion. And if you think of it, sharing is a very good way of showing solidarity. Um, and the thing is that, that there's no city that has all the knowledge, and every city has some knowledge. So what if we manage to exchange what has worked for your own city with others? And uh, so this is really the, uh, the essence of, of, of sharing. And, uh, and we see this nowadays that many cities have this notion mm -hmm. of uh, whether it's about cycling in the city or solidarity or energy transition. Um, so sharing in a way, if we want to achieve the SDGs, uh, it's really the way to go. Yes, and, it's a necessity. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of untapped potential. So the combination of the urgency mm -hmm. and the fact that we really believe there is room for improvement, this is what sharing makes it very exciting. And Ellen, what about you? Well, when I was invited to join the Closer Cities Initiative, uh, I really felt immediately that this was a good idea to get this started. Um, because as you mentioned, cities are growing around the world. Um, they're facing the same problems. And it would be a pity if everyone would be reinventing the wheel. Um, and knowledge sharing so may sound easy, but there's a lot to it and it's not as easy as it sounds. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm happy to be part of a team trying to, yeah, to stimulate that. I can see that. Um, and you're both so right about it. Um, Robert, you have been initiating this. Well, it's quite a huge project. It will, how many years be here? Well, we started last year in 2021 and we started the preparations about two years ago. Okay. And it will run for a period of 10 years. 10 years. And that's why we also connect with the Sustainable Development Goals ending in 2030. Right. And can you tell us a little bit more about the project? What makes it unique? Yeah, it's always difficult to say what makes something unique. But what we try to do, we try to bring something to the table. So we, we know there are a lot of urban initiatives, urban networks and best practice websites mm -hmm. and um, doing excellent job. And what we try to bring to the table is the constant interaction between urban science, urban practice. So actually closer cities, uh, the core is scientific research, but very pragmatic. So uh, we're actually driven by the idea that we want to have impact. And it also started with curiosity. Mm -hmm. Uh, because we know cities exchange knowledge in many ways right. via platforms, via city visits, peer to peer in many ways. So there's a lot of knowledge uh, research done on city uh, exchange, knowledge mm -hmm. exchange. But we are actually intrigued by can we improve something? Because sharing knowledge, it sounds quite obvious, right? Mm -hmm, like an open door. Yeah, right. So if something is very obvious and there's room for improvement, mm -hmm. well, is it very obvious then? So we actually value closer cities. We want to analyze what is hindering or can stimulate the exchange of knowledge yeah. across borders between urban scientists and, and practitioners and private sector. 
So this is really why we kicked off Closer Cities for this period of 10 years. Uh, curiosity. We know a lot, but we also know we still need to know more. And once, if we can take away the hindrances or give room for boosts, mm-hmm. this is actually the way to improve sharing. Right. But then there's a, there's a lot of assumptions. We think this, we think that. But we need to know what are these bo- boosts and barriers. And that's why very good solid research is is pivotal. Well, you give me a very nice bridge here to uh, to Ellen because um, Ellen, you're involved in the scientific part of the project. You coordinate the line of research. Um, what makes an idea shareable? Uh, that's a good question. Also a very difficult one to answer because no knowledge sharing process is the same. Uh, as Robert already mentioned, there are different factors that influence sharing. Um, they can stimulate it or they can hinder it. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's important to realize is that that knowledge sharing always entails translating your ID from one place to another. Right. So first, your approach needs to be sort of distangled from the environment, from the context. You need to have a shareable story. Uh, mm-hmm. That's always a simplification. You have to communicate that. Someone has to receive that, interpret that, and apply it in a certain context, a different one than where the idea was originally created. Right, so you sort of abs- abstract it. Exactly. And and this means that uh, there are a lot of requirements, actually. It, like I said, knowledge sharing sounds easy, but it's actually quite difficult because you need to be able to yeah, create this story to communicate about. You need to be able to communicate to, with each other, mm-hmm. to listen to each other, uh, to understand each other. And the receiving one should be able to, to implement it in its context, um, make sure that it fits, for example, existing practices. And this means that there are actually a lot of requirements if you want to share knowledge effectively. Yeah, so those are uh, could be uh, seen as barriers. Um, can you tell uh, tell us about what the boosts are? When when will it be successful? Yeah, well, that's always nicer to tell, of course, than <laughs> when it's difficult. <laughs> um, most important is that you're willing to share your knowledge. That's where it starts. And you need to be willing to receive knowledge. You need to be open for ideas from elsewhere. And as I mentioned, you need to be able to transfer your ID and to receive different IDs. And one important aspect in that is the context. Uh, you need to be able yeah, to understand what's going on on the other side. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it helps if conditions are similar. For example, if you're facing the same problem or if you have a similar culture or administrative system. These are factors that are helpful. They're helpful, yeah. So, uh, so motivation is actually really, really important. Yeah, that's and, key. And a similar situation, very helpful, I could say. Um, we've already received some questions from uh, the audience during the sign-ups. Um, I paraphrase this question by Zakaria Lakaheb. I really hope I pronounce this right, from Algeria. Um, to what extent is densification, in other words, compact cities, the solution to rapid urbanization? This one is to you, Ellen. Yes, well, uh, I must say I'm not an expert in, in densification. But what you see is that a lot of cities worldwide struggle with finding space where to leave all the people because the world population is growing. Mm-hmm. Um, you can either expand or densify within the city. Um, and this is an example of where cities can learn from each other. So different cities are, are struggling with this problem. Mm-hmm. Um, an approach that works in one city may work in another city as well. Right. Do you, do you have an uh, example of, of an approach? Of an approach for for this problem? For this problem, well, not myself. You would really have to ask an urban planner or some other specialist. Yeah. Um, but I know, for example, that cities in the Netherlands are also working on this, mm-hmm. um, trying to create more houses, for example, within existing city centers. Exactly, uh, going up. Going up, yeah. yeah. Uh, Robert, we also have a, a question from you, from another viewer. Viewer, it comes from Hanadi Hassan from the Ministry of Animal Resources. How can we solve the problem of land use for animal production close to urban areas? Yeah, another <laughs> interesting question. So, yeah, this uh, this relates to uh, urban land use and many cities need to deal with this. And mm-hmm. it's really there's no fence between urban area and the agricultural area. So there um, it has to be about um, the regional collab- collaboration. So we need to ensure that cities can reach out for agricultural products with the lowest uh, CO2 footprint possible. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so this requires a good uh, food region food system uh, approach. Right. And this is one of the topics which is already also on the agenda of the Floriade, okay. which is the World Horticulture Expo. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so it needs a collaborative approach. We, it needs to be in balance. Yeah. And uh, well, actually, well, every city, uh, whatever size, uh, needs to deal with this uh, balance of agriculture and urban area. Yeah, exactly, because you need it as a resource, but it's also taking in a lot of space. Um, what have been your most favorite experience with a Closer, project, a closer Cities project so far? Maybe give two ex brief examples. Yeah, sure. uh, yeah um, well, last year, so the Closer Cities initiative, it's, it's a platform, mm -hmm. it's an online platform, but it's much more than that. So we collect cases from around the world right. and then the, the researchers analyze the data. Uh, but we also do a lot of events. And, and last year we organized an event with the public sector and the private sector with the Global Compact Netherlands. And what's very nice that you see that the, the challenges in the cities that also the private uh, institutions and the private companies really want to contribute to this. And an important outcome of the meeting was trust. So it's very important if you really want to deal with the challenges coll uh, collectively mm -hmm. and effectively, then trust is very important. So it was a very nice online event. And the other thing is that we work together with students a lot. Okay. So with Master Urban Governance or the Erasmus University and, and minors. And so we think it's very important to really have uh, younger generations already connect with the topic. And mm -hmm. we all already see that the young generations really truly believe in this element of sharing. So yeah. this is very inspiring. It is. It's so, uh, I see this all around me. Uh, the, the newer generations are so uh, stung, uh, f fixed on this idea of uh, climate change, much more than maybe my parents, for, uh, for example. Well, actually, it's the logical <laughs> thing to do, right? It is. It's yeah. strange that you explain you share. It's, it's actually, well, that should be the basic, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's hope there. Sure. Uh, Ellen, what has been your uh, most favorite experience with the project so far? Yeah, th there are a lot of favorite moments. Uh, so I'd like to zoom out a little bit. Um, and what, what struck me is that people actually take the time to share their knowledge, share their projects with us. Uh, Robert already mentioned our platform. We ask people to share their project there. We ask them to give us some more information, sort of background information as well that we can use for the research. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually means that we ask two very valuable resources from people, knowledge about their project and their time to invest in, in uploading these projects. And yeah, it really strikes me that people take this time, that people are this enthusiastic about our project. Every time we talk to people, people say, wow, this is something we need in the world. And yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's fantastic. So apparently they really, there's a need for it and uh, people uh, um, spend their time on it. Um, thank you to so much for uh, sharing your insights with us and your enthusiasm about uh, the project. Thank you. Thank you. Up next are two new guests, uh, but first have a look at the following video. So now we have two new guests. We are joined by Professor Jurian Edelebos. We have a digital uh, connection with him. He's live with us, we hope. And at the table here is Thomas, Thomas van Luitelaar. Uh, we start with Jurian, if you don't mind. Sure. Jurian, welcome. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you loud and clear. Oh, perfect. Where are you uh, currently located? At uh, Rotterdam. Rotterdam, okay, so that's uh, pretty close to uh, The Hague. Um, Jurian, you work as a professor at the Erasmus University and you dedicated a substantial part of your career to community building. What is so fascinating about, um, about citizen initiatives? Yeah, I think nowadays citizen initiatives uh, contribute uh, to the provision of public services and goods, um, and which have become an important trend in many cities around the world. Uh, I find these community-based initiatives, I call them, you can also call them citizen initiatives, fascinating. 
as they show the vitality of cities, of societies in cities, so to be specific. Uh, as a scholar and also as the academic uh, lead of the interdisciplinary research community, Vital Cities and Citizens at uh, Erasmus University, mm -hmm. I find this topic extremely interesting and very relevant uh, with uh, community-based initiatives, citizens and communities take their matters in their own hands by tackling all kinds of wicked issues in their neighborhoods, like uh, poverty, exclusion, inequality, uh, well-being and sustainability. And these initiatives often have the, the ambition to form a very durable uh, cooperation among residents and the community members, and have also a very hands-on approach as they deal with concrete and daily uh, challenges people are confronted uh, with in their uh, neighborhoods. And these initiatives uh, are named in different ways in the literature, in the research, but mm -hmm. also in practice, of course, such as uh, social enterprises, self-organization, but also uh, grassroots initiatives. And um, yeah, these nowadays, these community-based initiatives have become an inseparable part of uh, our society. And that is, I think, truly fascinating. A fine example of solving urban challenges together, in my view. Fantastic. And uh, what, what is a grassroots initiative? A grassroots initiative is really something that is built from the bottom up. So uh, this community-based initiative uh, is very different from a traditional participatory, participatory project, uh, often organized by all kinds of local or city governments. Uh, participation projects are initiate, initiated and controlled by governments. They set in a rather top-down manner all kinds of rules and conditions. And uh, grassroots or community-based initiatives, they have take their uh, own initiative, matters in their own hand, they set their own rules and conditions, so that makes them really grassroots, built from the bottom up. Right, and I can, I can imagine that they have a very strong motivation um, while executing this. Uh, you just mentioned it, top down or bottom up, what works uh, best in your experience? Yeah, for this uh, community-based initiatives, they are truly built from the bottom up. So they set their own rules and conditions, and this is really a strength of these uh, citizen initiatives. Uh, the, um, they're very locally oriented, which means that these residents uh, are the driving force behind the initiatives. And they mobilize their own volunteers, their own people, work together with them, and they focus really on the local community needs in their neighborhoods. And also uh, you see that these forms of community-based initiatives are often an alternative, and sometimes a substitute to all kinds of traditional governmental uh, public services. And that is truly, truly fascinating. You see also that they strive for auto autonomy, ownership, and control uh, regarding their own uh, decision-making process. And this is also very distinct from all the traditional participatory projects, which are often controlled and directed by the governments themselves. And these initiatives also build their own business models and to, cre to increase their financial stability and also to make sure that they exist for a longer period of time. And finally, also these uh, community initiatives are linked to formal institutions, such as the local authority, governmental agencies, but also business organizations, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, to secure funding and also facilitation. Right. So you see that is, yeah, these bottom, these community-based initiatives are bottom-up by definition, but still have their relationships with all kinds of institutions that are more organized in a top-down manner. So it's really about also organizing this relationship between the community-based initiatives and the existing institutions. Right. And then they really become successful. And they can even uh, last long-term. Yes, exactly, because this this embedding, this network, connecting to the networked uh, environment is truly uh, important to become, to generate impact, mm -hmm. uh, to really uh, solve the problems at hand in different neighborhoods, but also secure a durable character exactly. uh, existence for a longer period of time. Um, thank you. Um, we are going to talk to Thomas, but please feel free to, uh, to join the conversation. Thomas, you work for NL Branding, Netherlands Enterprise Agency, and you execute the assignments for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, NL supports this endeavor. Why is that? Absolutely, we do. Together with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, which is our, well, I would say partner in crime for Netherlands Branding, and also the owner of the, the brand, 
Well, let me start uh, relating it to two different trends that we see. Um, the first one is the, uh, the rapid urbanization, which takes place uh, on a global uh, level. Uh, we have within 10 years, we have 60% of the people living in urban areas. And by 2050, we expect 70%. Yeah, it's getting crowded. But we also yeah. see it in our own country, yeah? in our own tiny country with border provinces that are shrinking, have people moving from the east to the west or to regional uh, uh, hubs. Mm -hmm. So that's the first one. The second one is about, um, I would say, the, um, uh, the growing polarization that we see. Yeah? Of course, also on a global scale uh, caused by by COVID or by Brexit, but we also see it in our own back garden or even in my own family or amongst friends. So, mm. uh, so that's like uh, two trends that we see, but the question is uh, how do we anticipate on these trends? And well, they are definitely, I think, changing uh, uh, the scene uh, with less space and little tolerance. And I think they really urge for creating uh, livable and sustainable uh, cities and communities, uh, uh, top-down um, uh, communities. Uh, all over the world. Uh, so I would say this is truly a big global challenge that we are facing now and we will be facing it for the next decades probably. And um, I think the Netherlands is really eager and uh, Netherlands is eager to solve this, uh, this challenge uh, and we are really happy to, to contribute to this in co-creation with others. I think that's the way forward uh, for us to go. And it offers us also the opportunity uh, to contribute to uh, an important SDG and a sustainable development goal, like it was mentioned by uh, by Robert as well. Well, maybe back to your question. I, I think we have a lot to offer. Uh, the Netherlands has a lot uh, to offer. Uh, the Netherlands is, on the one hand, a, a small country, uh, densely populated, mm -hmm. um, uh, but also um, with a lot of uh, a lot of people living in the same uh, area. Um, but it's also a big urban area, uh, I would say, and. On the other hand, we have some interesting urban experiences. Uh, they have come up also uh, through this initiative uh, in terms of building um, electric vehicle infrastructure or in contributing to like resilient cities in the big delta or even initiating urban farming initiatives. Mm -hmm. So I would say if you combine like this comparative geographical advantage uh, with the strengths and uh, the experience we have, I think we are really in a good uh, position to um, to contribute and um, yeah I think also um, uh, to come up with innovations that um, yeah that really involves all the stakeholders so uh, I would say uh, open inclusive and um, and inventive and well I'm convinced that we can be an interesting partner for the rest of the world yeah so maybe maybe one thing to add um, uh, because we can think of ourselves okay we are a good partner but how do we get this message across exactly yeah with closer yeah. cities, yeah. Yeah, with closer cities, definitely. <laughs> and um, I think it's not the way, okay, we can tr tr we can think, okay, we can try others um, how we think they should see us. Uh, but I think that's not uh, the way, so. Oh, well, we have some, some responsibility, maybe. Of course, but yeah. but on the other hand, uh, we always say, like, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. <laughs> yeah, true. And, um, well, that's also what we are looking for. Uh, we are looking for, for substance and mm -hmm. for proof. And I think this, uh, yeah, this idea and this, this platform is really uh, valuable there. Yeah. Um, and Jurian, um, how do you think projects like these can, uh, can help work worldwide? Yeah, I think uh, returning to the, the community-based initiative, for example, I think they are, these are very important to reach goals, uh, for example, the Sustainable Development Goals uh, worldwide. Um, they can help to reach a very open, inclusive, sustainable and resilient uh, society, societies, plural, across the world. Mm -hmm. And they are really meaningful for the vitality of societies and, and cities, as we've seen um, in these times of COVID, where they help people in need, for example, by providing food. However, we, we still have to learn uh, under which conditions uh, these uh, community-based initiatives flourish and become really successful and meaningful in practice. And we have, of course, uh, done some research uh, on this subject of community building, community uh, resilience. Then you see that uh, certain conditions need to be in place to make them really impactful like in what? society. Um, well, for example, you, you see that it is very important that they have a very strong core of members who are truly devoted to, uh, to these initiatives. But what is even more important is that they, have, um, that they really connect to the, to the wider uh, community in their neighborhoods. And this is uh, in order to, uh, to develop and to, uh, 
to make sure that there are enough resources and capacities to solve all these uh, wicked issues that they are confronted with. And this is called bridge, uh, bridging capacity. So bridging to a, pl to a, to a very uh, vari high variety of, uh, of uh, different communities in the neighborhoods. That's really important to have truly impact. And another condition that comes up uh, from research is that the linking capacity is very important to be in place. And with this linking capacity, you create good relationships uh, with other actors in the network. So not only about the residents and the communities, mm -hmm. but also to connect to governmental agencies, to business organizations, to knowledge institutions. And uh, you see that the community-based initiative that has become highly networked, highly networked entity, that they are very productive and they create productive relationships with other actors in the field. So you see then a kind of quadruple helix arrangements uh, develop in which you see knowledge institutions, companies, governmental organizations and these citizen initiatives work uh, together. And in this way, you see that uh, these collaborative uh, entities uh, show higher success rates uh, in, in terms of performance, uh, problem solving capacity and also in the way they uh, can sustain for a longer period of time. So it's really important to share this knowledge on the, the critical conditions for the durability and the performance of these community-based initiatives. And it's great to have this platform like the Closer Cities there that you can really identify with research what are critical conditions and also think how to translate those conditions to specific other uh, urban surroundings, other cities, other neighborhoods across the world in making this, uh, this knowledge really productive and, and really worthwhile and really practical for the people uh, are, are there, uh, living there and working there. Exactly, yeah, bringing the theory and the practice together. Uh, thank you so much, Julian. Um, do you have anything to add to that, Thomas? Yeah, maybe a small uh, thing to add. Well, I think uh, I mentioned um, uh, the, the pudding. I think, yeah. well, these, pro uh, these, these projects are really the eating of the pudding, I would say. Um, I'm delighted to see so many international um, uh, cases uh, that have been shared and uploaded. So also really a big thank to you to all our international partners and also to our diplomatic uh, network uh, who contributed and, uh, and shared. I was really positively surprised by the, um, by the richness and the variety of the projects. And I think they, um, yeah, they offer us some excellent learning um, uh, opportunities. And from the Netherlands, we are very eager to, to co-create, uh, mm -hmm. to co-create ourselves, but also to facilitate co-creation by others. But above all, I think we are really eager to learn. And that's uh, what this uh, initiative enables us um, to. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy. And um, I think to, to make really an impact on that uh, uh, famous SDG right. uh, on a sustainable city, I think we really need the creations and the innovations that were also mentioned by, um, uh, by Jörn uh, uh, and uh, with the, the quadruple helix. Uh, yeah. What's, that what's that? The quadruple, quadruple, quadruple helix? It's a tongue twister. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's really like the, the joint effort uh, of um, uh, public, private and uh, knowledge sector and above all the, the local communities. that Right, were, uh, that's were the addition, eh? yeah. Yeah. And definitely like the, uh, the, the cross-cutting edges, uh, the, the, just where the, they are interacting, I think that is really where the magic uh, happens. So, um, yeah, I would say let's go out and, and look for that, uh, that magic. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, you want to do a call to action? Yeah, of course. Yeah, if this is my uh, yeah, opportunity, yeah, yeah, yeah. Take then it. Uh, of course. Take camera no. too. <laughs> no, I want to, uh, to conclude by, uh, by inviting you all. Uh, so there's only one thing to say. Uh, let's solve uh, urban global challenges together. Exactly. And you can do this by going to closercities.org. You can uh, have a look at what ideas have been sent in, which means that they are... Um, that the initiators of these projects are uh, willing to advise you in implementing their ideas to your surroundings and, of course, uh, send in your own ideas. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Thomas, for being here. Thank you for your Welcome. learnings. Yeah. And thank you, Julian, for your time and insights. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we have talked about some very important theory, but of course we also want to have a look at some actual initiatives like this one by Maurice Prijs from Utrecht. Let's have a look at the video. I 
uh, we aim for a healthy life in an urban environment. In Utrecht, we have over 500 of those bus shelters. We want to, to create something uh, for, for bees, uh, where bees uh, will, feel, will feel very happy, but also uh, that makes people aware of healthy urban living and inspire them. So that's mm -hmm. why uh, we created our bus stops with a green roof. So um, that was very important to me to create, for example, the bus stops, because I will not only do it uh, for my work, uh, I also have to look at it when I uh, go on my bike through the city or I walk through the city then. I care about the environment, not only for my job, but also at my house, uh, in my back garden, for example. We have had so many comments from all over, all over the world and we are very happy with it. reply to them all and uh, give them all the information we can share with them. Uh, uh, my number one tip would be uh, uh, dare to do, dare to do and, uh, and create something nice for the world. Yes, we are joined by Maurice Breis, head of public space and permits and initiator of the green roofed bus shelters in Utrecht. Welcome, Maurice. Thank you very much. Good to have you here. What a fantastic idea. How did you come up with it? Yeah, that's a very simple question. Um, and they ask me a lot of times this question. And uh, the thing is, um, um, we, um, we wanted to do something for the environment. We, we all know what's going on in the world. We all know what's going on with climate changes. And um, what, we, what our aim was, was to have a look at um, a, a project, and it was the project of the bus stops, and to include something of the environmental things in it. So um, that was our aims to do, and uh, we were very enthusiastic to do this. And uh, because of all those enthusiasm, um, we wanted to go further than... Uh, where other people wanted to go. Um, so um, we included the bus stop with a green roof. Yeah. And um, that was just not uh, a way of a way of one way thinking. So a bus stop uh, and we want to have a new bus stop. Now we want to include something of it. Mm -hmm. And me and my team were very enthusiastic about this. And when we um, included the green roof on it, um, we got more enthusiasm and more enthusiasm. So um, that's what uh, th I think that's the important thing um, for us to go further than we would normally go. Right, because the reactions were so good. Yeah, they, they were really good. And all the people said to us, it's such a simple idea. And um, yeah, th that makes it very worthwhile of going further and further. Well, that's certainly the case because it was duplicated in, well all over the world. Um, and speaking of that, we have a live connection uh, with Adam Clark, who is the deputy city mayor and lead on environment and transportation in Leicester. Hi, Adam. Good to have you on the show. Good to talk to you. So we are here in the studio with Maurice, the initiator of the green roofed bus shelters. Um, could you tell us how did you hear about this idea? Well, I first heard about the idea on social media and from emails uh, coming from people all over, um, all over Leicester, all over my city saying, you know, why can't we do what Utrecht's doing? Um, and it's something I was really attracted to, but didn't know how. So when we were approached uh, as part of our bus shelter contract um, switch over to install some of these shelters, I was absolutely delighted because I knew that we'd be delivering what the people of Leicester wanted, but also what our environment needs as well, which was so important to me. Okay, so actually the timing was quite perfect for you. Listen, the timing is not only perfect for, for me, um, but actually perfect for cities and for the environment as a whole. The climate emergency, the ecological emergency that we're facing 
um, meant, means that we need innovation and we need strong creative partnerships to come together to tackle the environmental and ecological crisis. And what this is, is not only something that in itself both promotes biodiversity and public transport, but it's also um, something that starts conversations. It's something that makes us want to go further with all of our interventions that will help us tackle these really important issues of trying to protect and promote biodiversity and promote public transport. What more could you want? Good question. What more could you want? Um, you got this idea. How was it to implement it in your own landscape? Did you have to make a lot of adjustments or? So we, the timing was perfect, as you said, we were about to switch over our, our bus shelter contract and we were able to bring in Clear Channel to deliver that and that enabled um, us really to have a, a, a relatively smooth process. These things never go perfect. You have to be ready for the, for the unknown. But um, as far as we were concerned, the, the, you know, the project has been delivered as, as smoothly as, as possibly could. Um, obviously, there are, you know, there are issues relating to maintaining bus services, maintaining, uh, you know, maintaining the, the you know, pedestrian accessibility to their communities. Um, but these are things we would have had to have worked with anyway. Um, and actually, the, the value and the benefits we are getting are far outweighing any of the problems that have occurred. Well, that's fantastic to hear. Um, I can imagine that sometimes people see a, a project on the platform, but they are hesitant and they don't know what to do. Do you have any tips for those? Absolutely, I have. Um, you know, I, I think some some real reflection here that it, we we really need to be open to creativity, especially in local government, in local authorities. Um, as I've said, you know the. the the, time, the times we are in need, mean that we need to have creative partnerships between public and private sector. And we need to recognize that, you know, there, there are real opportunities here to, to do the right thing, but also to promote and and encourage others to do the right thing. So we're starting conversations, we're not only um, making positive interventions ourselves, but we're starting conversations in our communities about how we can not only make our environment secure for the future, for future generations, but to make our communities much better to live in now. And the inspiration that we've taken from Utrecht to Leicester is something that I know that people are looking at Leicester um, and seeing what we're doing and trying to replicate it there. And by cities working together and different sectors working together, we can really tackle the climate and ecolo ecological emergency that we're facing. So I think um, my, my tip, my real tip is be open to new ideas, enable new ideas, and let's take on these challenges with, um, with positivity and creativity. Thank you so much, Adam, for your time. That was fantastic to hear. Thank you. Wow, that's so inspiring to hear, right? Yeah, that's great. That's his, great. His his energy goes uh, through the roof. Yeah, and um, yeah, that that's really great, really great to hear. And that that's um, I think that's uh, one of the things what what we really wanted to create. We want to 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 inspire people, and that can be people that are living in your city, but also people living abroad. And um, yeah, it's really fantastic to hear. Yeah. yeah um, c do you know how many places have duplicated this idea? Yeah, sort it's, of? Um, so I, I, I think over 25. Over 25. Yeah, the, the thing is, and also Adam mentioned it, um, um, you are not going to renovate uh, bus stops uh, fr fr from one month to, to the other. You, mm. Sometimes you just have to wait till, uh, because when you, when you want to implement a green roof, um, it, it, you need to have a solid roof. Okay. Uh, because the, 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 there's just a big because weight. Because of the weight. Yeah, 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 yeah. of the weight. And some, in some countries, you will always have some snow on it. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that's really important to, uh, to mention that. Um, but what we see is it's a lot of cities, they start with two or three bus stops. Right. And um, yeah, so that, that's great. And it, it just inspires people. And people are also uh, having a look at the, the roof of their houses. And a lot of roofers yeah. on, on houses are empty, so they want to put also some, some green roofs on. Exactly. Uh, we also have some material of that. Uh, we saw a lot of um, media attention that you got uh, with this project. Uh, it was in all kinds of newspapers, and um, it also inspired people to place it on their own roofs. Really fantastic to see. Yeah, um, yeah we have a small look at it. 
Um, just to go back a little bit, because sometimes we hear that civil servants uh, experience barriers, barriers like, um, do we have enough time or am I allowed to share um, the knowledge we have? They may, may be scared of that. Um, how did you end up taking the leap by actually doing it? Yeah, I think there was a big will to do. Uh, me and my team, they really wanted to create something. And uh, as a civil servant, um, you know, to, to be quite honest, you're always limited to to, to boundaries, you know, mm. and there's just uh, the amount of money or there's there's just the task you have to do or there's some 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 other limits. Right. And uh, we wanted to uh, step over those uh, yeah, those limits and uh, to explore uh, more. And um, the big, the biggest thing uh, in me and my team was, I think, the enthusiasm. So we were all uh, c committed to do something well. And um, then it doesn't matter if you have to do something uh, what's not in your job description or something. Yeah, just or, go bold, Yeah, just, just go. You just dare to do. And uh, by getting um, results after results after results, you get more enthusiastic. And then it's just the will to, yeah, just the will to do. Exactly. Yeah. And um, then your idea was um, uh, also uh, in other places it, it was uh, being executed. And you sent me an email with all the information yeah. that other places get. And it's amazing to see it was full of what plants, what uh, season, and mm -hmm. these kinds of insects love these kind of flowers, and fantastic to see. Yeah. Um, yeah, how is it to, to share this knowledge with international colleagues? Yeah, we, uh, that's great. It, 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 it's, it's, it's also great fun to do, uh, because you just want to help people. And by sharing such an in-depth knowledge, um, you can give the people um, an idea of how we did it mm -hmm. um, and, and, and what kind of plants we used. And it saves so much time. Yeah, it does. <laughs> but on the other, uh, other end of it, uh, people can also uh, give a little twist on it. And, and, and for example, as someone from Australia said, uh, it's too hot for us. Uh, of course, for, yeah. for, for those plants, mm -hmm. but we have some other domestic plants that we can include on it. Exactly. Yeah. So everybody can give their own touch on uh, on just a bus. Uh, it's just a simple bus, bus shelter, but everybody can have a, a known touch on it, and that makes it uh, yeah, very special, I think. Yeah. Um, what can we do to make uh, jobs easier? What do you, what resources resources do you wish you have had? Um, I'm I'm not uh, someone uh, for um, very instrumental issues. You know, so n not not like we have to do, we have to have an officer or something like it's an international officer because um, by creating a, uh, like a job for something, um, you're not going to change the attitude. And I think the most important thing, and it's it's more about skills, is um, it's create uh, some attitude for people or give them some freedom to come up with ideas. And uh, when people are feeling free to do, mm -hmm. free to explore. They get creative. Yeah, they yeah. get creative. Although um, it's very hard to measure out because everybody wants to measure out these yep. days. Mm -hmm. um, you have to, how, ma uh, uh, um, how much have you done? And they want to have an exact number or something. But I think we just have to go around um, and go a little bit uh, to the other way and give people uh, 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 some more free mindset to do. Yeah. Um, well, for your free mindset, we uh, have a little surprise for you because um, we want to congratulate you and your project as one of our prize winners. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> um, because uh, let me explain why. Green roofs capture particulates, they store rainwater, they prov provide cooling and promote urban biodiversity and all of these extremely are extremely bio beneficial for our insects, right? Like bees mm -hmm. and bumblebees. And uh, we have awarded the project because of the proven shareability, obviously, the commitment involved and the impact it's already made across the world. So on behalf of Closer Cities and Partners, we'd like to award you with one personalized workshop dig digitally so you can invest Leicester mm -hmm. or other cities. Mm -hmm. And scientific partners uh, will take an in-depth look at how to make sharing even easier. Oh, that's it's great to hear. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maurice, for Thank being you. here. <laughs> 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 Okay, uh, another initiative we will take a look at uh, today is called Horticulture in Ghana for a Brighter Future. Let's have a look at a video about this project. The 
agriculture sector has potential to reduce rural poverty and youth unemployment. This made it interesting for a Ghanaian Dutch cooperation between TU Delft and Pada so College to provide a technical and vocational education training that will significantly increase employment within the horticultural sector in Ghana. I'm enthusiastic about this project because students learn the necessary skills and the entrepreneurial mindset to become successful entrepreneurs or be employed in any of the horticultural companies in Ghana. At the end of the four month training, these students are able to develop their own innovative business ideas. Through the Lead Farmers Initiative with the private sector, Holland Green Tech, we developed demonstration sites that train these farmers on new technologies and good agronomic practices. The farmers are able to understand the concept of farming as a business, but not just a livelihood. Other projects or cities can employ the practice of competence-based training through a blended approach not just the entrepreneurial mindset, but the necessary skills and expertise needed to be successful out there. Here with us is Lindsay Schwitter. Do I pronounce this right? Yes. Yes. Um, you work at the Innovation and Impact Center at Delft University of Technology and also Irene Oostveen, Senior Project Manager at the Association of Netherlands Municipalities International, has joined us. Thank you both for being here. Uh, Lindsay, we start with you. Can you tell us more about this project in Ghana? Yes. Um, as a university, we find it very important to share knowledge, ideas and innovations worldwide. And uh, we've worked already for a long time with, uh, with Ghana, with a partner university, and also with the private sector. So Deborah, that you just saw in the, in the movie, is a, is a colleague of mine. We mm -hmm. implement this project together. And in this project, we work together with uh, an agricultural college, because what we see is that uh, the horticultural sector in Ghana is growing very fast, and it offers many interesting job opportunities. Right. But the current educational offer was still very theoretical and not closely linked to what is needed, like the practical skills that are needed, but also the entrepreneurial skills mm. that are needed to become a successful farmer. Yeah, I can uh, see that. Um, so, uh, but how did it go? How did you start? You told me about Frank. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, so Frank is a colleague of mine. He uh, works at the TU Delft. He's from Kumasi, the second largest city in Ghana where we implement this project. and. Yeah, he always wanted to do something and some research or a very good project in his own country. Mm -hmm. uh, and like Frank, we have many others. Uh, so then came the idea to, uh, yeah, to see if the skills that we have with the Delft Center for Entrepreneurship, but also very concrete innovations like uh, the yeah. weather station that we'll you see here. We'll come back to that. Yes, to also share that. Um, and to also see, can we improve part of the curriculum to really give that a boost? But at the same time, also not just focus on the students and the staff, but also really on the sector. So we also work very closely with lead farmers. So Deborah works for Holland Green Tech, a okay. private sector company, to do it in parallel. So to really take a comprehensive approach. So not just only focus on education, but also mm -hmm. focus that future employers can also then host the students and the people that we trained. So to also really give them a very concrete perspective. Right, so to give them a durable uh, way of living. Yes, yes. Um, um, you started in 2019, right? Yeah. And what's the status right now? Yeah, it's going very well. So officially the project that started in 2019, it's funded by the European Union under the Archipelago program. And um, very soon after the project started, of course, we had COVID. Mm -hmm, <laughs> so mm -hmm, it became mm -hmm. a little bit more difficult to, to travel. But luckily, we knew each other already for a long time. So that really helped. Uh, and it also really uh, ensured that the courses that we developed and the things that we wanted to integrate in the curriculum became very embedded at the college. 
um, it's also it was impossible for TU Delft staff to go there. So it really had to be the teachers and the yeah, staff exactly. there yeah. that really learned it. And we were there, of course, online to support. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the end, it took a little bit more time to develop the course material and to work with the staff before we would actually teach it to uh, to the students and to the participants. But that also yeah, made it very um, yeah, embedded in the college itself and also very sustainable because they don't really then need us to come exactly, there and teach. Exactly. They really do They're it themselves. They are independent. Yeah, yes. yeah exactly. Yeah. And, and besides this project, your, your experience goes uh, way beyond. Uh, what do you think is necessary to really make an impact, if you look back? Yeah, very good relationship. Uh, it sounds maybe a little bit like not very tangible or, or, uh, no, or scientific, but to have a good trusting relationship and to have, I think, the flexibility, the patience, the the openness to, yeah, in this case, work together with an agricultural college and to really hear from them where we could add value and not to, yeah, try to think that we as Delft know what could work. Yeah, exactly. And really Kumasi. listen, really listen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, also make sure that it makes their daily work more interesting and more yeah. fun so that it also becomes nice to work <laughs> together it's, it's yeah. quite important uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Very important. Uh, it's it's funny the the trust thing it's it keeps coming back during this uh, event so uh, it's not weird that you say that at all um when we spoke earlier we talked about uh, projects that are um, uh, adjusted and repeated and then you mentioned a weather station in yes. several parts of africa yeah how did that go yeah so actually um it's it all started because, um, well, if you look at climate change or like the biggest challenges, of course, we also have them in Europe, but many of them uh, will also like hit uh, Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of our professors uh, actually ran into the pro problem that there is very little data, uh, especially about ground the weather. data. Yes, yeah. about the weather. So, for example, like rainfall. You could see clouds in a satellite, but that doesn't mean that it actually rains. To measure rain, mm -hmm. you need to have something on the ground, yeah. and it's very local. So this huge lack of data was something that he wanted to, to solve. Mm -hmm. And then he thought that we should make or see if we can like develop a weather station that is tailor-made and works very well in Africa. Mm -hmm. And then together with an African colleague, uh, they started to work on this weather station. Yeah, it's right here. Yes, it's right here. It looks um, so different from the ones we have in the Netherlands. Yeah, well, one of the biggest differences that people mostly immediately sort of see or stands out is that it doesn't have any moving parts. Yeah. So normally if you measure wind, you see things moving. Um, and this one has deliberately been designed to have as little parts as possible so they have it very compact no moving things that could easily break or yeah. get stolen or yeah things like that mm -hmm. and this one works on a solar panel so the thing you see on the front um and right now um of course we also had to test it and improve yeah. it yeah but this one we have more than uh, 600 weather stations all over africa more than 21 countries wow and we place them at schools, so to have them a little bit uh, safe and ask the schools also to once a month clean it a little bit. Oh, you say it like it's nothing, but to me it sounds very impressive. Yeah, <laughs> and this is like typically an innovation that, yeah, we made together with yeah. with our, our partners to make it fit and to, to make to it as cheap adjusting. and as easy and as maintenance free as possible. And it gives us extremely relevant data mm. about uh, about the weather, which is also for a farmer yeah. extremely useful. Exactly. So it's a win-win. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much. It's uh, great to hear about these ideas that were enrolled. Um, it's time to uh, switch over to uh, a new subject. Cities are very different uh, from another, but all are urbanizing rapidly and uh, we have climate goals to reach. But how can we facilitate knowledge, knowledge exchange and how can cities work together to improve? Well, to talk about it, we have an expert on this. Irene Oostveen, welcome. Thank you. Um, now, as a liaison in urban knowledge uh, development projects, you have a lot to share with us. And you know from experience about the importance of uh, international knowledge exchange, especially for local governments, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, 
and you are currently involved in the, I have to say this correctly, <laughs> Governance of Inclusive <coughs> Green Growth in Cities program. Could you tell us more about this program? Yes, oh, of sorry. course. Thank you very much. Uh, the program, uh, the, some years ago, already six years ago, um, worldwide, uh, countries made together a new urban agenda internationally under the umbrella of the, the United Nations. And our own uh, Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, supported that agenda, subscribed to that agenda, and also thought, how can we support development uh, countries, cities, mi uh, medium-sized cities, uh, to do to take their part on yeah. uh, on development, mm -hmm. let's say, in cities. Uh, there's a long, big recognition that a lot of the international agendas can be reached at local level with local authorities. Um, so as an association of Netherlands municipalities, we designed this program to work together with six cities worldwide um, for exchange of knowledge, technical assistance, capacity developments, um, yeah, basically working together on key issues at the agenda of cities and that's sustainable development amongst others. Yes. Wow. Um, and uh, we spoke earlier and you told me about a various project, one about a waste problem in, uh, in the city of Colombia, um, taxes in rights concerning pieces of land in Mozambique, a mobility challenge in Ghana, and you kept going and going. <laughs> the, the examples are really endlessly. Uh, when, when you look back, what do you consider your biggest success or most interesting results so far? Yeah, that's the fun of working with cities. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot tackle one issue uh, only. Uh, and I think that's also the success of the program because uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, on a green transition, on sustainability, is that it's a long term, uh, something that you can only reach on the long term. It's really a transition of way of working. So all the topics come together. You cannot really uh, tackle one issue separately from the others. So I think one of the biggest successes from this program is also uh, the integrated approach. So tackling, uh, for example, if you talk about the waste problem uh, in the city of Pereira in Colombia, it's not only about waste. We work there together with informal sector of waste pickers. Uh, they have to live somewhere. Yeah. They have a job, which is waste picking um, informally, but it's now formalizing. Yeah. Um, they, they have children that maybe go to school. It's an economic economic uh, challenge, it's an environmental issue, is waste, um, it's a social topic because people interact with that topic. So, and the biggest success of this program is if you approach it differently, area-based, human-based, um, then all these topics easily come together and uh, you will see that all the organizations that have a stake mm -hmm. from one perspective or the other will start working together. And again, there's this topic of trust. I was already hearing that it was <laughs> yeah. coming up uh, today. Um, but that is at the local level, very crucial also to tackle these kind of issues. And I think one of the successes of this program is that relationship management also between a lot of stakeholders. Yeah. Right. Uh, can yeah. you tell us also a bit more about the, the example you gave about the taxes and rights concerning pieces of land in Mozambique? Yes, uh, so we work together with the city of Beira. And uh, Beira is uh, a city on the, on the coast, the coastal area, a delta area. So as uh, the Netherlands, we have uh, kind of experience with yeah. uh, delta areas. <laughs> uh, but the local authorities are responsible for land management and especially also the cadaster to... Uh, and, um, and that's different from how we handle it here, right? Um, it is different, but not necessarily. And one of the big ideas that also we have in the Netherlands is uh, land management companies. Uh, so we helped to support the land management company of the municipality in uh, Beira mm -hmm. uh, with the digitalization uh, of land uh, documents, uh, land rights. Re they weren't, had, or, yeah. Exactly. So that you can also work together with the people working on land or living on land that if there needs to be a development on that land be because it might not be a safe piece because of uh, flooding or, or right. other uh, kind of issues mm -hmm. um, then you have uh, you can work on compensation rules and uh, you can uh, as a municipality of course there's a lot of maintenance to be done if you want a new sewerage um, system or other kind of public works, uh, roads, uh, social housing, etc. Of course, you need uh, income, and that's where we support the municipality also to improve their processes for taxation. Oh, wow. Yeah. It sounds super complicated to me. <laughs> well, in the end, uh, 
I don't think so, because you work together with a lot of people who have the knowledge. Uh, you just bring them together around the table and start discussing their issues they have to deal with and start to think about solutions together. So in the end, it's, it's a lot of facilitation and, and bringing the right people uh, together at the right place. Oh, so um, uh, what, what, what advice would you give to a local government to, to get involved? Always reach out. So uh, go also talk to your neighbor municipalities in the first place, but also at the national level, there are association of municipalities. At regional level, they are there. There are thematic associations of municipalities. Um, so you can learn from each other. So you can look at what the neighbor is doing and try to see whether that will work for you. And it's really good to, to have that open yeah. view keep the, the interaction or search for the interaction exactly and and, and the best thing is to go and visit see for yourself experience feel it because you can read about it but it's not the same it's not the same <laughs> eh? no. uh, thank you so much irene and also thank you Lindsay, for um, for sharing your uh, learnings with us time for our last guest so sit tight to get even more inspired the project we are going to look at is called feeding cities and migration settlements and to talk about this we have a live connection with katrine soma katrine welcome thank you very much it's nice to be here today so uh, for your introduction, you work at the, the Wageningen University and you are the initiator of the Nairi Kibera Fish Rural Urban Food System in Nairobi, Kenya. Am I correct? I work at the Wageningen Research, so it's part of Wageningen University and Research, but it's not at the VU. <laughs> you are in, you are Norway, in Norway right, right now, right? right? I'm in Norway, yeah, right now. But the Temperature um, at your place? It's minus 10 degrees. Ooh, minus 10 degrees. <laughs> Oh, what a big difference um, from here and from Kenya also. Um, thank you uh, for taking the time to talk to us. We just showed uh, 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 several other projects. And this one is called Feeding Cities and Migration Settlements. What was the initial reason to start this project? What was the main problem? So the main problem uh, is uh, the uh, hunger. Uh, it's uh, relating to the SDG 2, zero hunger. Uh, that is the main objective of the, of the program that uh, is called uh, Food Security and Valuing Water that this project belongs to. Uh, so uh, this is one project of eight actually belonging into that program. And uh, we're looking at uh, uh, informal settlements, the cities and migration into the cities, which is a very urgent issue when it comes to food security and uh, safety as well, when you think about all the informal settlements that are developing in cities, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, these uh, issues are very urgent. So, so what did you do to make it better? We uh, have a project, and it's a, actually a Kenny's Basis project originally. Uh, that means that it is uh, based, it meant to be uh, research uh, related, very scientific. So we uh, started with selecting a lot of data sets. We have interviewed uh, 386 households in the, in the slum, Kibera slum, uh, twice uh, in the Corona time uh, in August 2020 and uh, in August 2021. Uh, so, and, and in addition, we have uh, carried out research when it comes to the vendors, so the traders uh, of fish in Kibera, and also the small scale fish farmers, because we're looking at food systems, rural urban food systems, where you have uh, interrelationships between uh, cities and rural areas in terms of f uh, people, food, and also money, money flow, of course. Because um, when we spoke earlier, you said um, the fish were very small. Yes, <laughs> because when we did all this research, we thought, OK, um, we were working with the locals uh, and uh, we arranged um, um, workshops. So in another workshop, uh, sorry, in another project, I was leading a project on aquaculture. Uh, it's the aquaculture part in a 3R Kenya project that is also about horticulture and diary. Uh, but in this workshop, I presented uh, a documentary that we had made in Kibera, and one of the people uh, in that workshop representing the fish farmers in Nyeri, uh, which is a, a, a city 
200 kilometers north of, uh, of Kibera, they said, we have a lot of small sized fish. 70% of what we produce is uh, under what we can, smaller than what we can sell. So what we uh, did is that we thought about this excellent idea uh, to sell that uh, to a low affordable price in uh, Kibera. And uh, we did a lot of effort to make that happen uh, because it's not uh, easy, especially when a rural area is not connected to uh, a city area, then we uh, um, need to do a lot of, uh, solve a lot of problems on the way. And because of excellent um, co-ownership and cooperation locally, uh, responsibilities were taken to solve all the small problems that had to be, take, be taken. And uh, uh, then uh, in August, 2020, we actually uh, managed to, to deliver one ton of fish and since then, we uh, deliver one ton of fish every week uh, from wow. Nieri to Kibera. And this is, not, of course, uh, really nice. It's a research project, and we did implementation at the same time. And it's showing how relevant it is to combine implementation and research. Wow, fantastic. So you went from small fish to a ton of fish. Uh, literally, and um, you connected the rural areas uh, to, to new connections uh, and new communities. Exactly, because there is completely different tribes. You have the Kikuyus uh, living in the Nieri and a lot of Luyus or Lihuya in, in the Kibera. Uh, they, are, 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 uh, they are connected to, to Lake Victoria usually, so there are originally also fish eating. But uh, to connect these uh, two areas and to success successful is also uh, interesting because of the different tribes involved. Uh, that sometimes, and especially in the yeah in the in the election period, which is now, uh, they have some tend to have some conflicts. But now in this nice cooperative uh, <laughs> project, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> Um, so you gathered a lot of data during this project and uh, some of it you are still analyzing, you told me earlier, but uh, can you share some of the results with us? Yeah, we have done, um, I mean, we, we published in a scientific article the implementation part that we have done. Uh, so that is, that is a result in itself, uh, scientifically as well. Uh, we have analyzed um uh, uh, consumption of fish in uh, kibera and we have found really interesting things like people are willing to pay a little bit more for 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 tilapia because they uh, are, want to be sure it's not uh, imported fish uh, for instance and uh, also the small size fish are very important because they can distribute it to a big family without big having big uh, sizes of, of fish uh, but also the, the social capital uh, study where you see the relationship between trust and food security. That is extremely interesting and it's just about to be published now. It's, not, it's still not published, but it will come soon. And uh, that is also new in, this, in, in the scientific literature. Um, but we have a lot of data to, to analyze and we will definitely come uh, back to that uh, later as well. Well, but this is already fantastic news that there is a correlation between trust and food security. I mean, we can work exactly. with that. Yeah, mm. the, exactly. And it has it has been uh, uh, there has been some studies earlier uh, saying that that uh, indicating the same. Uh, and in this survey, we also find out that that is the same in Kenya. Uh, and it is indeed interesting because uh, not not yeah you, you you can define trust in in different ways in some ways it's uh, uh having uh for instance if you have um trust in in people you don't uh, know mm -hmm. uh you, you have a negative correlation for instance so that if people are really trusting people they don't know they seem to be less food secure but if they have a strong connection and trust relation to rural areas and to the neighbors uh, then they they have a, a, a a lot more food secure yeah. indeed. Um, we also have a, a viewer question. It is sent in by Hans from EK, Netherlands Enterprise Agency, and he wants to know, uh, do you have examples of suitable solutions for upcoming markets like South Africa? What tips can you offer from your experience? 
Yeah, we're puzzling a lot with the, the scaling issue uh, because what we see, and that is also what we have found with the other surveys, is that to make this scale, to scale this uh, um, uh, this um, uh, business model or value chain or food system approach that we have been using, uh, we have to solve the core bottlenecks first. And uh, um, what we have are trying to do in, in uh, or not trying, we have actually come quite far. We want to have small scale fish farmers supplying fish to the uh, low income groups uh, in, in, in informal settlements. That means that with very, very small square meters or cubic meters of producing fish, uh, they need to uh, increase their production. So what is what they need is actually uh, effective uh, recirculation aquaculture system, which is also climate adaptation and reuse of water. And then they can multiply their production of fish uh, 20 to 100 times, uh, which is a very effective use of, of and climate uh, friendly way of using the area. The other thing is the market. So if you have uh, a market system where you uh, operate some of the uh, fish to process, for instance, hamburgers or, or fish or something, you need, uh, you, you can value add you and you can also help, especially the fish traders, the women that we work with in Kibera, they could benefit a lot from that as income as well as the consumers. So it's really looking at the, the market uh, is important and the investment opportunities for the small scale fish farmers to invest in the rust systems. And then these systems uh, can be scaled up in Kenya, but 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 everywhere. And we're, we're working very hard to make uh, uh, steps towards that direction in Kenya to show that it works. Because that is what we're so happy about, it works. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's really obvious that it works. Uh, thank you so much, Katrien, for, um, for your time and for sharing your knowledge. Thank you so much. Okay, so, um, oh, wait, wait, are you still here, Katrine? <laughs> we have um, a surprise for you. Uh, we also have um, uh, to congratulate you because, um, because of the stellar citizen engagement and the importance you give to the SDGs, we'd like to award your project and your prize is a ticket to the Floriade, so you can invite a partner to this hub of knowledge sharing. Thank you so much. That is so nice. Thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and we have three more prizes to give away. The first one goes to Sid Blanco Jr. Uh, congratulations to you. His project Metroots in Brazil was initiated because they did not want to wait for others to take action for achieving the SDGs. Metroots is a network of organizations from the public and private sector, civil society and academia. And they collect and analyze data on SDG 11, namely inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable cities in metropolitan areas in Brazil. And because of the proactive, hands-on approach of your project, where you act instead of waiting around for anyone else to do it, we like to award you. And your prize is the creation of a video offered by Closer Cities and Partners, so you may spread the word about Metrods even better. And then we congratulate Ashok Jan. I hope I pronounced the name right. At the start of the COVID pandemic, the world was flooded with pictures of a blue sky above Asian cities, cities that normally are covered in a gray blanket of air pollution. And this project aims to improve air quality management in Delhi and India. And so far it has identified the main causes of air pollution and in action plan has been created to reduce pollution. And because of the well-rounded approach on such an important and daily relevant project, we award you with a prize. You win a personalized digital workshop where the academic team can take an in-depth look at the project and gives tips and tricks for improvement in the future. Yeah, and then we have one more prize to give away. Last but certainly not least, congratulations to Ete Kwini Emergency Shelter in Durban, South Africa. They established 12 emergency shelters for the homeless to contain the spread of COVID-19. And in this way, more than 300 homeless people could be reunited with their families. 
No Musa Shembe, congratulations because of the quick thinking about such a huge issue and the great benefits of your project can have for the world. We'd like to award you with a workshop together with the Closer Cities academic team. We can see how you can spread this great idea across the world. So um, congratulations to all of you. And in addition, um, Joost Geijer, head of the economic department at the embassy in New, New Delhi, also wants to say something in this video. I appreciate very much the initiative of solving urban challenges together, the best practices for cities. I would like to congratulate all the winners for their solutions and specifically I would like to mention the Indian candidate, Mr. Ashok Jain, for his solution to manage the air quality of New Delhi. I wish everybody good luck. So today we discussed uh, how we can solve urban challenges by sharing knowledge, which sounds simple, but in reality, it can be quite challenging, but it's also very possible. Now, we've seen how trust and being willing and being able uh, is key in translating knowledge and in applying it in a different context. Well, let's say, uh, let's continue the dialogue and let's walk the talk. And uh, we've seen how important it is to be in a continuous interaction between urban science and urban pr practice. These are not two separate worlds. They really need each other. And there is really so much great urban knowledge out there and it would be a waste if we would not use it. Um, so we need to notice and embrace the large as well as the small works by the uh, civil servants, by the private sector, citizens and researchers. Now, of course, we all want to achieve the SDGs by 2030 and it's really inexcusable if we are okay with untapped potential and if we keep reinventing the wheel while we can also learn from others. No single city can do everything, but everyone can do something. And um, yeah, the same goes for individual individuals as well as for nation states. And therefore, we kindly ask you to keep submitting your ideas to the Closer Cities platform for three reasons. You get to promote your lovely project, you can inspire urban professionals all around the world, and you contribute to a research project of great importance. We um, think that if we manage to optimize urban knowledge sharing, that we can really uh, make a difference and are convinced that it can make huge progress. So let's solve urban challenges together. It has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.